The Quality Blue Primary Care Program is a really an innovative program that we put together a little over four years ago to work in a fundamentally different way with primary care physicians to help them take better care of their patients. And um, in essence, it's a program that rewards them, not for the volume of care they deliver, but for the quality of care and the value of that care. And what enables it is not just the financial rewards, although that's a part of it, it's really sharing data and sharing best practices. So one of the reasons we're here today is to have primary care physicians from all over the state come together and share their success stories, how they did it, so that collectively we can all get better. We're extremely excited about the results with Quality Blue. We think it's been a key factor in helping us improve the quality of care that patients receive and lower the cost. It represents our focus on partnership with the provider community. Kind of the holy grail of healthcare for us is, can we figure out a way to make people well and save money at the same time? And the Quality Blue program, uniting 700 primary care docs around the state into one unit, is really getting us going in that direction. Um, the docs essentially get paid for doing what they went to medical school to do, which is make people well, improve the quality of their life, and most importantly, keep them out of the hospital. The results have been really amazing. Uh, what we've seen is that uh, care has improved, so for chronic conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, uh, heart disease, uh, the, the care has improved so that people with hypertension have their blood pressure better controlled, people with diabetes have their diabetes better controlled, and there's less complications. And the good news is that not only is the care better, but the cost of delivering that care is lower. Because by preventing people from having exacerbations and complications, um, you reduce the cost of care while improving quality. I think through multiple ways, through alternative payment models, certainly has come into play, which has been a big benefit to, to tackle a program as ambitious as this one. Um, I think certainly um, uh, footing the bill, so to speak, for an uh, expansive uh, data analytics software tool has also been very key uh, so that practices that are not, uh, that are not large scale can uh, participate as well. Um, certainly they have a great team of, um, uh, 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 of workers who, who certainly assist us with any type of questions and, and um, um, hiccups that we have along the way that I think certainly um, um, streamlines the, the care delivery process in a way that you know wasn't uh, able to be done probably five or seven years ago. We have a very simple mission at Blue Cross and Blue Shield Louisiana and that mission is to improve the health and lives of Louisianians and I would suggest that because of that we're linked uh, you may not be caring for all of Louisiana but certainly for your patients uh, I would think every day that's exactly what you're trying to do, improve the, their health and their lives. And so uh, we're honored and delighted in whether it be small ways or large ways uh, to help do that uh, with you. So I just remind us that the Quality Blue Primary Care Program uh, and other things that we do with you are for us very mission centric and uh, um, are exactly the kinds of things that we want to promote and grow um, moving forward. Now, there's been a fair amount of change in healthcare um, and in the country since the last time we got together in this uh, room. And um, I'll just comment briefly uh, on some of the things that have changed and some of the things that um, maybe should and will stay the same. Uh, Unfortunately, and I'm sure you're all seeing this, uh, in the individual health insurance market, um, for a whole variety of reasons, we're seeing a lot of instability. Um, we in Vantage Health Plan are the only folks left as people uh, start signing up, which they started on uh, uh, Wednesday uh, to, to do that. Uh, virtually every other carrier has uh, you know, left the market. Obviously for us, we think um, it's very hard to fill that mission I talked about you if we're not there and, and present. Um, we also, because we take that mission seriously, 
some of you may know we've uh, done a joint venture with what was Amerigroup Louisiana, is now Healthy Blue Louisiana, and we wanted to find a way to serve the Medicaid population. Again, why would we want to do that? Well, if you believe in that mission of improving the health and lives of Louisianians, you can't leave a third of them behind. Uh, so uh, as we stand here today, uh, we, we're very proud of the fact that we continue to serve the commercial individual market. We have found a way to be involved in the Medicaid market. Um, we're in our second year of trying to serve the Medicare population through our Medicare Advantage uh, program. And we continue to, to try to be a leader, and I think we are being a leader, in the uh, commercial group uh, market. So really, uh, we're trying to find a way to offer uh, our services to virtually anybody in Louisiana, uh, any walk of life, uh, wherever they are through the, the, the state. And our Medicare program, while it's only in 30 parishes this year, uh, moving into next year, uh, we will be uh, statewide. So um, why is that important to you? It's important to you because we think that if we're serving all those populations, that we can do a better job of aligning with you uh, around the, the quality and value outcomes that we want to get and providing, hopefully over time, some consistency of objectives uh, and, and measures. Um, so we've started having dialogue with the Louisiana Department of Health on what are their quality objectives for the Medicaid program. And, you know, as Vindell and I have, have talked with Secretary Gee, trying to reduce some of the noise and confusion uh, across payers so that we can get uh, traction. And I will just comment that I learned some of that from what I heard last year. So when we were here, the focus, for example, on improving hypertension and really making a concerted focus on that rather than trying to boil the ocean led to some phenomenal results uh, in all of your practices. And I think we're going to hear about some of that, again, focus again today in some different areas. So we would like you to continue to view us as an ally and as a resource, uh, as a way to um, be rewarded for improving, but also uh, work with us to decrease some of the barriers, some of the noise, and some of the friction that uh, you may see day to day uh, across all your patients um, because for us, going back to that mission, anything we can do to improve the health and lives of people in Louisiana, your patients, we want to do that. Um, so let me make a couple of other comments about some things that, that have not changed. I think that um, unfortunately in Louisiana, like the rest of the country, um, health care um, remains uh, unaffordable for a lot of people. The current administration's decision to not fund cost sharing reduction subsidies has led uh, to us having to increase our rates to make up for uh, that uh, shortfall. Hopefully um, the folks in Washington will come to their senses by the end of the year, but we can't uh, guarantee that. So um, it's more important now than ever for us collectively to find a way to deflate that health care cost uh, balloon because unfortunately the cost of health insurance is largely determined by the cost of health care. And um, I'll just give you guys some real scary numbers uh, if you don't know these. Um, if you are an individual buying coverage and you don't qualify for any of the subsidies, um, which means a federal poverty level about 400 percent, which for family of four is a family income of $100,000. So those are not people that many people, it's clearly way above the uh, you know, average income in Louisiana. You're going to spend 30% of your gross income, gross income on health care. And you know, probably what you'll see for your patients is th those health care costs, and not just the premium costs, but the out-of-pocket costs over the last 20 years have basically, for the average person, squeezed out spending in all other areas of their, of their life. So that has not changed. I don't see that getting better. Um, so us taking a shared responsibility to try to do something about that, the escalating cost of uh, health care when new pharmaceutical drugs that are coming out, the, the new CAR-T uh, cells, 
which may be great, but at $500,000 a year uh, for a course of treatment, um, those are the kinds of things that, if not used appropriately, will just continue to escalate uh, health care healthcare costs. The other scary thing about costs that I will share with you, and again, you may know this, is we actually, over the last few years, have passed what I will call an unfortunate uh, um, bellwether event. As a country, we now spend more on pharmaceuticals than we do on physician services. And, um, you know, I would suggest that um, that may be because we have drugs that can do things that um, we couldn't treat before. Certainly, um, things like hepatitis C, we have new drugs for those. But as a country, we're spending about 3x for that drug, what other developed countries around the world uh, are, are spending. So that's just to put in context, of, you may not be thinking about health policy every day when you're seeing patients. But I would say that's not a policy issue per se. It is very real for uh, our members, your patients, who are struggling to afford uh, the care they get, the premiums they, they get. And I think uh, it's great that we're able to engage in work with you that is simultaneously trying to improve the quality of care, but also do something to deflate um, the, you know, the costs. Um, What's great about this event for me um, is not just recognizing, and we're going to do that later today, that, um, that's well deserved, but it's also bringing you together to, you know, understand that you can learn from each other. Uh, this is a, a collective effort, um, and I think um, beyond sort of the individual contributions, um, hopefully you're finding as a group that uh, continuing as a community, I'll call it, of, of people working together, uh, we can continue to make great, uh, great progress. A um, couple things about the company and the direction that, that we're moving um, in is uh, we are uh, very committed to what I would say is positive change. And so we are going to continue to invest in primary care. We're going to continue to invest in supporting physicians. And we're going to continue to find different ways to do that, whether you're in a small practice, a large practice, or a part of a large health system. Um, so uh, what some of you may have seen is we're, we're trying to do innovative things with the provider community. Uh, we announced something uh, earlier this year in New Orleans with Oxnard. Um, and it's not exclusive, but we want to fundamentally change uh, from a volume-based relationship with them to a, a value quality-based uh, relationship. Uh, we're having different conversations here in Baton Rouge with uh, Health Leaders Network, uh, the FMOL folks with Baton Rouge uh, Clinic. Um, we're continuing up uh, in Shreveport to work with, you know, folks I've met there, family doctors, Bozier, et cetera. There's been some new entrants in the marketplace like Allidade. We're going to continue to work with there. The reason I'm saying that is uh, we want to meet all of you in whatever practice environment you're in, wherever you are, uh, and, and try to make you successful, understanding that you're, you're different. One of the ways that we're going to do that is with data and information. And so one of, there's a, there's been a very deliberate um, reason why we've hired certain people who you'll know, meet here today. One is sitting up here with me, uh, Vindel uh, Washington. Um, strategically, why it was great for Vindel to join us, and I think one of the opportunities that he saw is he could bring his experience um, from the practice community here in Louisiana, linked to his policy experience that he got when he was in D.C., and also his background, not just as a physician, but in health IT uh, and uh, information to help us continue to transform, transform our organization. Um, that's also the reason why we created a whole new division at Blue Cross in data and analytics and brought in a colleague that I've worked with before, before Samesh Nigam, who's uh, at the table here to fundamentally change um, our ability to not just share information with you, but integrate information that you have in your offices 
with our information and give it back to you in as close to a real-time way as possible and in a way that's actionable for you to take better care of your, your patients. So I say that because we want you to have the financial rewards of a program like Quality Blue, but, but even more importantly, we want to enable you uh, with information that uh, gives you a view of your patients that are maybe broader than you might have within your own office, including where they're getting care, whether they're taking their medications, and other things that, they, that they've done. So um, that, that's our commitment. Um, I would ask all of you, if you don't think we're living up to that, to these things I've just talked about, call us out on it. Uh, we want to be accountable with you, and if you think we've missed the boat on something, uh, and we're not uh, paying attention to something that's important, uh, let us know about that uh, too. Um, again, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I want to emphasize with you how important this program and your participation and work is with us and uh, just echo again our, our commitment to uh, making all of us as successful to deal with what are really critical, critical problems. I think the next Unfortunately, the next two, three years will be very interesting time for health care uh, in this, this country and in our, in our state. Uh, and while we let the policy issues swirl around us, um, and we certainly are trying to influence those, uh, we don't want to forget today to day that we can still have a tremendous impact on, on individuals by improving their care. So with that, um, I will uh, turn the podium over to the person that really knows what's going on, which is my colleague, uh, Dr. Vindell Washington. Thanks, Vindell. A lot of what we're here to talk about today is the emphasis on partnerships. And so if you talk about really what we're doing in the Quality Blue programs, if you talk about really the direction of the company, we're spending a lot of effort and energy with this concept that if we have good partnerships and have alignment with providers, it means good things for those that we serve across the uh, state. So I have a, just a little bit of uh, introduction here. Um, I'm an emergency medicine doc. Um, I spent most of my time on the provider side of things. I've been interested in technology for a really long time. I sort of cut my teeth in the administrative space, uh, a little bit in North Carolina, but also when I got here with the FMOL HS system, I see some of my friends at the table over there. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a great time, and, and I also uh, most recently spent some time at HHS as the National Coordinator for Health IT, and I thought before I actually made any remarks uh, this morning, I, I would get right to the sort of cocktail party question that I pretty much get almost everywhere I go these days after leaving the administration, and, uh, and I apologize to those of you who've heard the story before, but really the question is, how does a guy who's not a campaign volunteer, not an academic, and clearly doesn't have enough money to be a big donor for a campaign, <laughs> how does that guy get to sort of direct the national uh, health IT agenda for an administration? And so the, the story sort of goes like this. I um, felt compelled to give my opinion about what was wrong with meaningful use and you know, shared it loudly enough that our, our good senator uh, heard that and invited me to speak to the um, Senate Help Committee. And so I went there, sort of unbeknownst to me, uh, sort of just spewing out, as I usually do, the thing that was on the top of mine and kind of how the world should be different and tilted on its axis slightly differently. Went home, thought things were all fine and good. Got a tap on the shoulder a little bit later from uh, Secretary Burwell that maybe there is some service that I could provide. And so I felt kind of like it was when I was in the Army that you get tapped on the shoulder and it's your time to serve. But you know, I have four girls, and within that is really the kind of lesson of it all. And that's to say that you should not complain about something if you don't have good insight and intuition about really what the problem is. Because when I got there, it was like I was the dog who caught the car. It was a very very tough and up, uphill period of time, but you know, I was, I was pleased and proud to serve at that time and uh, really um, put me in a position to understand really the power of uh, the payer, and in that case CMS, and sort of adjusting what happens in a community of health care and how you could sort of, um, sort of leverage that to be a force for good. One of the things that we sort of finished up there was uh, the work on meaningful use, uh, which became the kind of um, the advancing care information. Um, we felt like we did a pretty decent job on adoption. 
we felt like there was really um, a, a long arc to be, um, be, be helpful. And I, don't, and I do know, I actually heard a little bit even more this morning at our PAC meeting that there are still some burdens from the EHR that uh, folks use uh, that came out of that uh, $35 billion spend. But I think really part of what we're talking about today and over the session is how this information flow can be the basis of moving quality forward. I think if you really talk to folks at their base, they understand that there's really no way for us to get to where we want to go in terms of information sharing, improving care, reducing costs without sort of a backbone of uh, health IT. So let's pivot. I just want to cover just a couple of items in my, in I, in my 15 minutes. Um, a couple of items are sort of the macro environment, and uh, Steve mentioned this just a little bit before. I'm not going to belabor this, but I want to run through a couple of items. I want to land on a couple of things that I think might be not as front of mind to you, and I want to paint the picture for why we're focusing on not just our partnerships here, but our partnerships more broadly in the community to look at things like social determinants. So the first step is probably a baseline discussion, really about how we're still quickly increasing the healthcare spend as a percentage of GDP. Steve mentioned the fact that individuals can't afford it. There's also an argument that we as a, as a country are behind in the ability to afford it. And I also want to talk about really our um, ability to sort of deliver quality care at a, at a cost, and I want to put a twist on that as well. So clearly you've likely seen this scorecard. This is the World Health Care Report card that has the list of countries that are developed nations and kind of where we stand with some of the the common global measurements of, of quality of, of health care that's provided. But I do want to tell you that it's a nuanced position. I sometimes have an opportunity to speak with folks and I ask them a question, particularly those who uh, tend to be my physician colleagues and the like. I won't do it at this meeting, but I ask people how many have taken advantage of their ability to go anywhere in the world to receive care. Often you'll have those audience members who actually have contacts and maybe even spoken or have colleagues that are international, they could go anywhere they want to go. If you ask them how many of those people actively engage in this sort of medical tourism concept, it's often just a handful of hands in the room. Most people get the care and the care of their loved ones close at home, whether they can afford to go other places or not. And I think what that paints, it paints is a, a more complicated or nuanced picture. So what this first slide uh, in that sort of complex picture says is that some of what makes for those disparities is how we spend our healthcare dollar relative to other countries that are developed countries in the world. So the, one of the, the items you'll see is we certainly stand above other, uh, other countries in terms of the dollars we spend on healthcare, but we also lag many developed com uh, countries on the dollars we spend on some of the things that are the other determinants of health and health status in our community. There's sort of a part two to that. Um, and I first heard this story when I was uh, speaking uh, or visiting with a group in Salt Lake City. So if you look at Baltimore, those who know Baltimore well, and if you look at kind of what happens around the Inner Harbor where the big high rises are and where the new stadium, oh, I guess not new anymore, but the stadium is and Phillips Seafood and those places, and you sort of go out of town toward where they filmed that show The Wire, sort of more to the Hopkins side and uh, where you probably don't want to be after the evening hours, you find out that what you have is almost a 20-year discrepancy in people's life expectancy. So what I would argue with uh, you in this case is that two things. One, that in the country, we often have a situation where disparities in care affect the quality of care that folks receive. And the reason that many of the affluent audiences I get to speak with don't raise their hands about traveling, traveling to Singapore or Guam or some other place uh, many miles away is that there is great care that can be found in many of our cities across the country. Uh, but we have some troubles with how that care is distributed and how folks are able to manage some of those social determinants that, um, that we have that face us that are challenges. Now we do have a local cost problem, so I think that some of the way we spend that dollar and, and, and the reference point I'll use there as an emergency medicine doctor is I certainly have been the guy in the ED that's handed out bus vouchers for folks who can't get home. So I think in some instances we are paying for medical services and we're paying for some social services with dollars that come through that sort of funnel of uh, medical care. The cost problem that I have underscored and that I have a slide here to depict really says that we 
even in that milieu have a problem in Louisiana with the cost. And this is a data set that essentially says if you look at um, the conditions and the markets, and there are about 400 markets in this, we have the, uh, the sort of dubious distinction of having many of the top 10 markets there. And so I think much of the work that we're doing here today is about increasing the quality of care that's delivered and trying to have that be delivered at a lower cost. And I think the good news for us is those things are not mutually exclusive. Often great care does equal lower cost care, particularly if it's coordinated care. We spent a little time in our PAC meeting this morning talking about sort of the drivers in this. I have only just one or two take homes on that. One of those is that the pharmaceutical costs are quite high. I won't reiterate it very much because Steve mentioned it in his opening remarks, but the bottom line there that there are drivers here that have tipped the scale. One thing that I will add to what was said earlier though is that the time frame, the time frame we're talking about is not a period of decades. It's not, we're talking about from 2009 to 2015 where this switch has flipped from paying pharma and pharmaceuticals in the, in the way of prescription drugs to physician payments on that healthcare dollar. Almost everything else has remained from a percentage rise relatively the same. It's really been this change in pharma. One of the things that I, that I do know is the case, and I know this from every time I've sort of uh, met my colleagues in a non-business setting or if I sort of stumble into the doctor's lounge by mistake, um, the point of the matter here is that we, we know that over that period of time, physician salaries have been relatively flat, but we do know that the pharma costs have really outstripped that in every way. One of the things we're trying to do, particularly with the Quality Blue programs, is to both align incentives and reward physicians appropriately for providing great care for patients. That's still a challenge for us. I want to add one other construct here around the Quality Blue program. Um, this is really around information flow. I'd mentioned before that one of the things that I tried to work really hard on in DC was increasing and improving the flow of information because I do believe it's the backbone of how we improve care in the country. It provides us the analytics that Samesh and his team and others are working on. It provides the source of information for Don Cantrell and our VPs and her team to sort of, sort of reach out to you, co collaborate and coordinate with you on care delivery. But that information needs to uh, flow and be free for this activity to occur. And so what we are hoping from a learning uh, activity, and you'll have some more of that from Dr. Jeffries later on, is that as we talk about things like our hypertension and other initiatives, that we take the best learnings that we have from academic institutions or public health institutions. We push that information into your electronic health records or your care delivery systems through either registries or clinical decision support so that at the bedside you have the best tools to help you direct to best care. We bring those up with you in your uh, joint operating committee meetings with us as a payer. And then that in turn allows you to practice the best medicine with the best data at the point of care. And we also believe that as things go further down this pathway and sort of the right lower side of the slide that more and more and more you'll have monitoring that's done for patients and patient care in their settings, whether it's their Fitbit or their um, Apple Watch or any of those sort of devices where clinical information comes in from those areas to help us really have a learning health system. And the learning again is around cost and quality as we go forward. So the Joint Operating Committee partnerships are important in that. I'll just list a few of those uh, ideas and concepts that we're particularly excited and interested about. And we're also talking about our population health management. I had mentioned that team earlier, but I want to make sure that we also list the uh, referral line because even if uh, patients are, uh, are of concern to you that are not in programs, we want to make sure that we're providing the right amount of support and backbone for you in that space. We're particularly excited about that work. Um, we have distilled it into this one last slide that I want to share with you. Um, the interesting thing about it is uh, it was one of the things that was most attractive to me about being able to join the Blue Cross team. There was much alignment between the activity that we were trying to do and the administration, that is to try to, try to deliver care that's better, care that's smarter, care that's healthier. And the constructs behind those are that we want to align payments with our provider uh, folks so that the things that you're doing that push the ball forward here are also things that are good for your bottom line so that you're not sort of caught in that paradigm of trying to do a bunch of things that are not sort of both in the patient's interest and your best financial interest. We want to make sure that on the smarter perspective, it's evidence-based medicine, that we can support you in that, that we can provide details, data, analytics to help you move that ball forward. 
And we want to make sure as we distribute information that we're good partners in that. I think that that's one of the challenges that um, Steve, as CEO, has laid down for us, that we're good partners in that. The data is timely, near real time, that it provides you guidance and, and provides you the backbone of support that you need in moving forward. So again, um, I'm very happy and pleased that you're joining us today. I'm also looking forward to the award ceremony later on because really a lot of this is to allow you to network with one another and to celebrate your successes. And I uh, really appreciate your participation in the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Washington. And now I'd like to share with you some numbers uh, that reflect where we are in our uh, QBPC program after four years of growing and continuously improving. These are numbers from September of 2017, 678 primary care physicians, just under 282,000 uh, attributed members, and a little bit over 113,000 members with one or more of our four chronic conditions. We have paid out uh, over $27 million in care management fees. But I'd also like to share with you uh, where we are in reaching our, our quality goals in our four chronic disease suites. Uh, you can see, uh, well, you can't really see from this, but I'll tell you that, that this has uh, shown improvement over the entire uh, four-year period, and it's growing again uh, this year. We have more information in the packet about the growth of uh, our QBPC program and also about the way we continue to support our PCPs and with uh, the uh, improvement and success of our Quality Blue uh, Value of Partnerships uh, programs. We are ready to announce our highest achievement in diabetes care goes to East Jefferson Internal Medicine. It's Dr. Lenito Sinead's clinic. Our highest achievement award in hypertension care goes to East Jefferson Primary Care, Dr. Nicole Giabrone's clinic. Our highest achievement award in vascular care goes to Bozier Family Medicine. Our highest achievement in kidney care goes to the family doctors in Shreveport. <laughs> and finally, the grand finale. We're going to announce the highest overall performance award for 2017. This slide shows the criteria. I want to note that this award recognizes the clinic with the highest average overall scores for the periods on both the clinical quality and the efficiency measures. I'm sorry, for all four periods for both categories of both quality and efficiency measures. The clinical quality measures are based on your Blue Cross patients with the targeted chronic conditions. And remember that the efficiency measures are based on all of your Blue Cross patients. Not only will the, the winner receive a plaque to hang in your clinic, but we also add your name to the perpetual plaque at, that is kept at Blue Cross to announce the Quality Blue Highest Overall Performer of the Year. Are y'all ready? Without further delay, it's my pleasure to announce the winner of the Highest Overall Performance in QBPC for the 2017 program year is the family doctors in Shreveport. I'm a, I'm a big fan. I think I've, you know, been involved since the rollout, you know, and then I think um, it's been a, a, a certainly a success for patients as well as a, a cross containment tool for, for Blue Cross. Absolutely well deserved. All of them moving in the right direction. Best thing that could happen for the people of Louisiana who are willing to commit to a primary care relationship, which should be everybody in my opinion.
We are delighted to, to recognize uh, those physicians and those practices that have really done a, an outstanding uh, job. And I think it is really well-deserved recognition. Uh, these practices have embraced the challenge of improving care while simultaneously improving value. And I think uh, what's really uh, encouraging to see is I think that in many cases over the last, not just year, but three or four years, I think they've exceeded their own expectations and what they were able to accomplish by working together with us and by sharing information with each other. The key component of it, as I mentioned, is collaboration and partnership. I think it's the first of many building blocks where we look at providers not as uh, folks across the table or, uh, or folks to be bargained or negotiated with, but really part of an ecosystem that's together raising the quality of care for those in the community. It's imperative that we identify the causes of illness as people age, chronic conditions, blood pressure, high cholesterol, creeping up blood sugar over time. All of these things are the targets of the Quality Blue program. These docs are fixated with laser-like focus on making those conditions be controllable and to keeping people from developing acute conditions, no heart attacks, strokes, or diabetes. But one of the things I've noticed is that we really have opportunities to address broad items that we would have otherwise not been able to address. I think this idea of an aligning incentives so that we're paying folks for value as opposed to the volume of care delivered puts us in a different situation in our state and allows us to do things that we would otherwise not be able to do. Do you anticipate that more doctors will participate in this program in Louisiana? We do. We think that uh, more primary care physicians will find value in doing this. Uh, we want to work with them across the spectrum, so we're working today with uh, smaller practices that are independent, with larger uh, primary care groups, and we're also working with primary care physicians that are part of multi-specialty groups or even health systems. So we think that there's a way to really bring as many people into the program uh, as possible, and then we want to expand beyond primary care. We want to make this not just about the primary care physicians taking good care, but we want the specialists to be engaged and the hospitals and the rest of the delivery system. When you align incentives, it takes physicians away from the treadmill that they've been on for many years in medicine. So now the kinds of things that before would have been unpaid activities are now part of a larger ecosystem of care delivery. And in that ecosystem, doing those things that are not unit cost, fee-for-service items actually help their bottom line. I think removing this conflict is one of the things that doctors are most happy about. It's not just the financial piece of it, it's really this idea of being able to care for the entire person. You need a partner as you age to help you understand exactly what's happening to your body as you move on through your life. Little simple things we do to ourselves, we don't think have much of an impact, show up in increasing blood pressure, increasing bad cholesterol, and increasing blood sugar, all of which can lead to bad outcomes. You need that primary care doc as your referee to really take a look at your game of life and help you to understand what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. I think it's a great program. We're very excited about the work that we've been able to do. We're excited about the partnerships. We think it's been a great way for us to link arms with our colleagues in the community. We think it's been a great way to really improve the quality of care for the citizens that we serve in the state. If people have questions like more information about what should they do? Uh, if people want more information, they can go onto our website and look for the Quality Blue Primary Care Program. And, uh, of course, uh, you can always call the company and ask for information. And best of all, what I would suggest is pick a Quality Blue Primary Care physician and ask them.